But I think it's a fantastic time to be talking about some of these issues. Um, as Eva said, it's very, very topical. Uh, and we're facing big, big challenges. We all know that. Uh, the economic crisis, environmental degradation, uh, so social fragmentation, and other issues uh, which we need to face up to. And the cities are the places where these, um, a lot of these issues are thought about, dealt with, uh, not, not dealt with as well. Um, I've just been asked to, um, uh, and I think um, that while that's important for planning, and uh, me as a planner, uh, I think about this all the time because we, with, I'm thinking five, 10, 20 years ahead in each of the places that I work, um, is that planning has to rethink the way it works. Traditionally, we've had a kind of predict and provide approach. We said, oh, the population will go up by 2% a year. Uh, this many children will, 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 will be born. This many schools will be need to be built, etc." But we're operating in a very different world now. And to be honest, that old predict and provide centralized approach to planning uh, didn't really work anyway. Um, I quite like this um, image here. Um, I feel like the planning system has been punched in the mouth. Um, Mike Tyson had it, had it right there. So we need to rethink our approach. Um, in terms of the three days, uh, most of the people here will be working with me for three days, which is great. Um, today we'll be talking about the green city. Um, really looking at the challenges that cities face, some of the responses to those challenges, and then some particular sort of green city projects uh, that, that will lead us quite nicely into um, some presentations, which some of you understand prepared around the Madrid-Rio project. Um, tomorrow we'll be discussing uh, the political city and urban design, looking at the contested nature of how cities change and how people, um, different communities, get involved um, in the process. And I'll take you through an interactive session there as well and some other experience that I've got. And then finally, uh, on the third day, we were looking at the complex city, the idea uh, of how we apply the theories of emergence and different thinking to how cities change. Um, what I hope you'll get out of the next 12 hours um, are three things. An understanding that urban thinking, urban design, urbanization is vitally critical to making sure uh, that we all have a good quality of life and the world uh, is a positive place to live in. Um, secondly, that behavioural and social cultural factors are as important as environmental ones. I could, quite frankly, stand here for the next three days and talk to you about green technology in cities, but I won't because it's easy to find online um, and actually my view is that they are only a small part of the solution. Uh, and lastly, again, this last point around the idea that we need both bottom-up and top-down complementary activity within society to make uh, things work. And planning has been very poor at uh, the bottom-up and, and attempting to do a top-down approach. What I want you to do is to work with me in the next 12 hours. I hear you're a very interactive group, which is great. Um, I want you to help to demonstrate that you understand some of the issues that are faced by cities. You live in a city now. Most of you probably have been brought up in a village or town or city. Um, your experiences are valid. Um, I want you to generate ideas, communicate them clearly and succinctly, um, and to bring thinking from other disciplines um, to bear on the issues as we raise them. This is Uruk. Um, it's um, probably the first city um, that was uh, formally sort of recognised in the world. It was built about 6,000 years ago in modern-day Iraq population of about 50,000 people. And the, and the forces which drew the city to be created of clustering, of people trading, of defence, are, are very similar to the kind of growth in cities that's happening today. Rather ironically, um, Uruk um, declined because it wasn't able to adapt to climate change in the area. And it wasn't able to adapt uh, and, it, and, it, and it built up too much debt and it wasn't able to defend itself, which has some resonances for modern day cities. But the other point I want to make about Uruk is it's only 6,000 years old and human civilization is obviously a lot older. So urbanization is a very, very recent phenomenon in essence. 2007 is a very, very important year um, because of what Eva mentioned earlier on. It's the first year that the UN estimated that uh, the human population was more than half living in cities. The, and, and the cities are... are growing across the world. I'm going to talk through, uh, it's a global phenomenon. Um, a lot of the urban population um, is uh, more than 50% in, in large parts of the world, as I say. Um, and that growth has been very, very recent. So in 1800, only 3% of the world lived in cities. 
took them 100 years to get to 10%, which is still relatively low, mainly in industrialized nations, uh, such, as, uh, such as Britain and other places in Europe. But then suddenly from 1900 to around 2000, it's increased over 53% at the moment. And that's due to continue to increase. The next 40 years, we're going to have another 50% on top of that, as it were, of people living in cities. So this is an enormous, enormous challenge, unprecedented. Um, yes? So would you like to know how many people have to live in a, together to be called like a city? Um, <coughs> there is no strict definition. There are many, many definitions of cities. Um, I'd, it, it would certainly say in the many tens of thousands. Is a, is a normal one. But the different countries, different cultures have different understandings of cities. And sometimes you have towns which are adjacent to each other, but because they operate as a city, because in essence they're so close that they are one. So it's, it's a complicated question. But I could hopefully give you an idea. Very, very importantly, um, at the moment we have one billion people living in informal settlements in the world. Um, they face a huge range of different issues from land tenure right through to flooding, um, poverty, etc. This is one of the biggest challenges uh, that, that, that face us. And the numbers are simply staggering. I mean, uh, 5 billion people will live in cities by 2030. So I, I'd try and argue that it's probably one of the critical questions in getting right in terms of making the place more sustainable. In terms of the growth, um, it is a global phenomenon. But you see these rings show where the majority of uh, these large cities lie. And they tend to be in Asia. And in fact, um, four of the top five cities in the world are actually in Asia. Tokyo, 34 million, uh, which is the biggest conurbation in the world. To give you an idea, Madrid, is, with its region, is about six million. Um, so we're talking something enormous. Um, Delhi, Shanghai, Guangzhou and Seoul, all about 25 million people or so. Um, so these are the mega cities. Having said that, though, much of the growth will actually happen in the sort of small to medium scale cities of the 250,000 to half a million. So. Um, and much of the response, although lots of people live in sh shanty towns, governments, private sector developers are throwing up lots and lots of buildings like this around the world. This is a global phenomenon. Hundreds of thousands of towers are being built. Um, it's estimated in China alone 64 million homes a year need to be built to accommodate their urban population that's growing. Um, and a lot of people are moving to things like this, which is kind of ironic because um, I generally tend to work in the UK context. Um, and in the 60s and 70s in the UK, we spent a lot of government money uh, and time and effort building high-rise development, sort of high-rise 60s housing. You may have seen some of the, and it, it happened all over Europe, but we spent we did an awful lot of it in Britain. And I spent most of my time trying to sort out those and solve some of the issues those places created. So my fear, I suppose, in seeing some of these images and being some of these places is that we're storing up enormous problems. Uh, for the future in terms of how these places actually function. Can I just ask, am I going too quickly or is this okay? I'm aware that not everyone's a native English speaker. So this is, this is a project I'm working on at the moment. Um, it's a place in South East London. It's called Thamesmead. It was built as an exemplar sustainable community in the, in the late 60s. They didn't call it a sustainable community, but that's what they meant when they talked about the things they wanted to achieve with a mixed, balanced bunch of people, places to work, near places to live safe and secure, green, etc. It also happens to be one of the most, prob it's probably the biggest problem area in the whole of London. Um, and there's 5,000 homes there and we're spending uh, many, many months and years and people have done the last years trying to sort out the problems here. We'll probably talk about this project a bit more, it's, it's, it's fascinating. Another thing to say is that in its time it was thought of as, you know, as the state of the art. 10,000 people a year from around the world visited it in, in the early 70s to see if they could take back the learnings back to their own countries. And yet now, in London, we see this as the, the biggest, one of the biggest problems that we're facing. So just because someone shows a nice, nice shiny image doesn't always mean that it, it's actually a, a positive outcome. Cities are immense consumers of resources. Um, another statistic, again, 75% of the world's CO2 is produced in cities. Um, and we'll discuss. Um, but, but at the same time, only 2% of the world's surface is actually covered uh, by cities. So, these are intense agglomerations of people with enormous uh, consequences. In fact, if you took the whole world's population um, and, and the density of Paris and put it into one city, it would take up about three states in the United States. That's the entire world's population in one city. 
If it was London, which is a lower rise city with more suburban kind of form, it would take up about five states of the United States. If you took Houston, which is a very sprawling place, um, I don't know if you've ever been there, it's very car dominated, it would take up the majority of the country. So it's not just about a number of people, it's the form, it's how they actually work and live together that's really important and that we're going to talk about in the next three days. So um, as by means of introduction, rather than me just talking at you because um, uh, th th that will be very tedious after a bit of time, um, I would just want to go around and ask uh, people um, to just tell me what village, town or city they're from and what they consider to be the single most important issue facing uh, that city. If you were mayor of that city you wanted to make it more sustainable, what would be your number one uh, thing that you would try and do? Uh, I'm going to pick on someone to start, I'm afraid, but we will just quickly go around the room. Please make it less than... Oh, yes. There is a microphone here as well. Um, please make it less than 30 seconds, otherwise we'll be here a long time. But just a quick introduction and say where you're from and what you think the key issue is. Sorry, sir, do you mind, do you mind starting? If you think it's on, they can hear it in the... With okay. the I'm, I'm from Seville. Okay. And, uh, well, the main challenge that Seville should... Uh, it's probably about the um, communication. You have uh, infrastructure for, for communication in terms of transportation inside the city. Okay. Because it has a strong historical center and uh, many problems to, to build the uh, metro. Okay, so, so it's about getting public transit to work. Thank you. I'm from Madrid and I think the main challenge in Madrid uh, would be transport and the quality of air. Yeah. Right now in these days, hmm, you can see a big... Lots of smog. Yeah, a lot of smog in the city <coughs> because of the uh, uh, stability of the climate, which is many days of the year in, in Madrid. Thank you. Um, Can everyone hear at the back, by the way? <coughs> Can you hear the people at the front? Okay. I work for the Energy Efficiency and, and Renewables Agency here in Spain, IDAE. And I'm from a little town in nearby Madrid, which is uh, 80,000 inhabitants. Its name is Guadalajara. And I think the the greatest challenge for the city is not, um, well, maybe it's transport, inside transport, what is the, the way that the uh, population moves inside the city. But apart from that, I think it's uh, reinventing the city to what it's uh, the main businesses that uh, the city wants to project its actions in the future. It's more interesting for them, for the, for the city as a whole, mm. more than the sustainability and what is the, 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 the low carbon city standards. Okay, so it's an economic question of what the city should be. It's an economic question, I guess. Yeah, Thank you. It's more important. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm from Cartagena, which is a... Sorry, can you speak up a little bit? I can't hear you. I'm from Cartagena, yep. which is a small city in Murcia, and uh, I think that the most important problem in Cartagena is that every everybody use the car for for go everywhere. Almost. Yep. Uh, it's a pro it's a pollution problem. Sure. Thank you. I'm from Madrid, and well, I, I agree with him that I think that one of the most important important problems here are the transport because of the pollution and maybe also a good way to improve it with uh, kind of uh, efficiency on the use of electricity. Yeah, okay. Does it work? In, uh, th I, I think it works, it goes into the computer over there so um, please project your voice. So. I'm from Madrid and uh, I think the main uh, challenge is to provide an environment in which people can work uh, in an effective way and uh, in other terms, that we produce more than we consume, and at the same time, in a kind of environment which provides a nice, uh, pleasant uh, place to live. Quality of life issues there. I think that's very, very good points. Um, I live <coughs> here in Madrid, and I agree with all of them. Quality of air and pollution and about transport are the main challenges. 
Okay, thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Laura. I'm from Madrid as well, and uh, I agree with them. I think the, the main problem in Madrid is pollution and uh, the way that people think. Uh, we need to change it because nobody wants to leave the car at home and going by <coughs> public transport. So this is a problem. And another thing that I think is uh, uh, a problem that we may be facing is that everybody spends lo lots of hours at work and they don't have time to spend with family and, you know, in social time or whatever. So I think this is a problem of uh, urbanism because we spend a lot of, of time in transport and, you know, we sure. cannot. So thank you, very, thank thank you. you very much. Hello, my name is Marie. I'm from Munich. Um, Munich is known as a very expensive city. And I think that one of the challenges is to integrate people from other countries because a lot of people would like to come or come, is coming there and um, they are in very dense areas. And so it's, I don't know what social issues it creates there. So it's about integration, social cohesion. That's a very good response. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Rodrigo. I'm from Caracas, Venezuela. Yeah. I think the main issues in my in my city would be the the way what it was built. Since we have two cities, uh, you have the slums and you have the whole city. So there are two cities which are not connected. You also have a problem of public transport, which doesn't integrate the city and uh, forces people to have cars. And since we have the uh, cheapest prices in the world for gasoline, well, uh, traffic is really a problem and a waste of time. A waste of time um, matter for pollution and. Or well, many things. So basically, it's urbanization and public transport, in my point of view. Good. I think it's good that you made the point that they're linked together. Oh, do you want to go, to go backwards, <laughs> and then otherwise we'll. Uh... <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Uh, my opinion, uh, apart from uh, sorry, water, where, where, where are you from? Uh, from Madrid. Okay. Okay. So. Apart from uh, water and energy supply, which are other problems related to urban growth. Uh, I think uh, a very big challenge is to get a well-balanced urban structure because we have a lot of uh, many, many uh, only residential areas far, far away from, from offices areas where people work. So that causes the transport problems yes. here in Madrid as well. It's a good point. So it's about creating more mixed areas so you can live and work and you can get local services in the same place. Thank you. Hi, my name is Patricia, and following, I'm from Sao Paulo, Brazil, and following the points of um, Rodrigo and my peer here, I'm going to talk about urbanization and uh, how the city has burst because it attracted jobs. Because we have a huge migration in Brazil from the rural areas into urban areas, as it has been trained in the world since the 70s. But this caused, uh, uh, the, the city is not planned, so it was expanded in a controllable way, and it created a lot of slums. And we, because we compete with the industries and the commercial center in the same capital, the, the industries release a lot of problems in the city and creates a lot of problems by attracting these people to come here, go, go there, and at the same time, the government don't provide um, housing planning. So this is a, a huge struggle in Sao Paulo in particular. Sounds like lots of linked issues. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hello, I'm uh, Luca from Bologna, Italy, north of Italy. Uh, I think uh, the main issues of my city is uh, that it's a historical city. So in the center, we cannot drill uh, to have a subway. So the transportation is the uh, main issues there. And uh, yeah, we have a lack, a lack of uh, cycling uh, routes. So it's not uh, really sustainable, and we need to move uh, just by car, and there's a lot of traffic jam there. So that's right. it. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm Manuel, I'm from Granada. And I think the main problem in the city, well, in my city also, is that we, we have to change like our mind no? to consume all the th things. And the main problem, I think, is the, the energy we have. <coughs> And yeah. of course, the transport. We have to mix also the integrated renewable energies and all the things. <coughs> I think the main issue. Thank you. Um, hello, um, I'm Shafrina, and I come from Malaysia. And um, well, I, I grew up in several cities, but uh, two of which are New York and Kuala Lumpur. 
And um, the key issues that uh, I managed to uh, observe when I was growing up in these two cities was um, congestion and also pollution. Um, in Malaysia, for example, uh, congestion is a big problem um, because people, we have public transportation available, but people don't really use it because it's not that well connected to the parts of the city and outside of the city um, that the people need to go to. Um, with regard to pollution, we um, experience mm. haze, a lot of haze, <coughs> but that's not only a result of the congestion or combustion of vehicles, it's also from um, the pollution that comes from Indonesia. When the, they, when they uh, encounter pollution in Indonesia, the air gets blown to Malaysia as well. <laughs> so that's a, a cross regional uh, problem. Response, well. yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And the same for New York too. Uh, good morning. Good morning. My name is John. I'm from Bilbao in the north of Spain. I think the, there are two main problems. The first has to do with urban density and, and uh, structure and uh, has to do in this case uh, dealing with stopping suburbanization and metropolization. And uh, the other main challenge has to do with urban renewal projects that usually they are developed in the central areas, but I think it's really important to do it also in the neighborhoods. Thank you, very good point. Hi, my name is Diana from Bogota, Colombia. And I think that Bogota faced uh, two main problems. The first one is the good quality public transportation. Bogota is a city around 8 million people and we don't have a metro, for example. So it's, it's incredible. And this is related with the, den with the lack of density of the city. Bogota is really extent, it's really large. And for example, the new buildings or the housing the new buildings are being built around in the surrounding area because it's cheaper. So the city is getting large and large and large and we don't have good quality public transportation or public services that could connect the city with, the, with all the people with the city. So I think it's the main two problems that the city faced. Thank you. Just in terms of this side of the room then, so it's mainly about um, a mixture of, a lot of issues about transport and its relationship with, with the way in which the city is developed, its structure, its density, the form of the city. Um, discussion about where we should invest, whether it's in the central area or in peripheral areas. The idea of that sprawl. People are saying that there's this uncontrolled development happening uh, in certain places which is unplanned. And these are all linked issues, and I'll discuss them briefly, but there's a good, good bunch of summaries there. Uh, just if you keep it quite quick, because we're going to run out of time otherwise. Hi, I'm Adrian from Madrid, and I have to agree with all the people from Madrid, pollution and <laughs> Pollution and transport, thank you. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm from Warsaw, Poland, and well, first I want to say that's transportation, but after what Diana said, I don't think it's a bigger issue, because we, have, we are a three million people city, and we have one line and now a second building, so <laughs> we're getting there. But uh, the main issue, I think, is that um, during the communist time, there wasn't any urban planning. So the city was in a big mess. And actually, only now we are starting to having a, a central planned city to where to build uh, high buildings, where to build, like, um, I don't know, people, uh, district where people live, and, and so on and so on. So I think the urban planning is the main issue here. OK, thank you. Hi, my name is Akuma, and I'm from Baku, Azerbaijan. And the biggest problem with um, Baku is that it's a pretty small city, but everyone feels like they need a car. So then you have cars parked everywhere on the sidewalks, and it makes it very unsafe for pedestrians. Hello, I'm Tatiana. I'm also from Madrid, but I live in the outskirts. and. In my city, where I live, um, during the last years, uh, there has uh, it has happened a, a very fast urbanization process. <coughs> and for me, the most visible consequences is that uh, now we have much less greener areas that we were used to enjoy in the past. So part of the natural value is lost. And also, you can easily see an increase of traffic jams, congestion, air pollution which I think it's just a decrease of the, of the quality of life of the inhabitants. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Derek. I'm from Rotterdam in the Netherlands. 
Uh, in our city, we have two big problems. One is the pollution. We have uh, a big harbor, which needs to be a bit moved out of the city because the pollution from the harbor is normally blown into the city because the harbor is in the west and yeah, the wind comes from the west in general. And the other problem is that in the Second World War, almost all the center was destroyed by yeah, German airplanes. Sorry, Marie, but <laughs> <laughs> it happened like that. And now they are still reconstructing the city, and the city is too empty. There are not many people living there, only working. So during the nights, it's desolated, and people, they don't feel safe. So yeah, they have big urban uh, challenges. So, very good points there. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jana. I am from Lima, Peru. And I think that the big issue of Lima is that immigration from rural zones to the city. Uh, in Peru, we have 25 million people, but in Lima, they live 10. So <laughs> uh, there is a great conversation of people, and they live in the, in the valleys of Lima. Uh, so they has invaded for, um, uh, um, man, many zones. No, and uh, they live in the worst condition you have ever be, uh, seen. And also the traffic jam, uh, we, we also don't, don't have a metro, so there's, it's a mess. Oh, this is an interesting phenomenon of um, SWAT settlements when they have to be on the periphery of the city, have even more of a challenge than those that are able to occupy old industrial areas in the center of the city. But we'll come on to that as well, thank you. My name is Natalia, I'm from San Jose, Costa Rica, and <coughs> the main issue of my city is that it lacks of a good public transportation. So this leads that everyone needs a car, and now it's, we are a small country, so there are more cars than highways. And the urban planning, it, it's obsolete, it's like 12 years uh, behind, so we're facing a growth with no, with no direction. Thank okay. you. Hi, my name is Laura. I'm also from Bogota. And besides from the public transportation problem, I think that our problem is also that many people from the rural areas have moved to the city. Yeah. And this have caused, of course, problems in housing, in unemployment, and security. Hi, I'm Fabio from Brazil, from Sao Paulo. Uh, there is an endless number of issues to What's the number one? What's the number one? <laughs> yeah. And, uh, but I, I will highlight like the traffic jams, the pollution, and uh, the zoning issue. Hi, my name is Carlos. I'm from Barcelona, Spain. And the two main challenges in my city, I think, that are also the pollution, but also the, um, the density in the core, in the center of the, of the city, and also the insecurity. So that's an interesting contrast with Rotterdam, where you're saying that you know there's, there's actually a different issue that the, 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 the centre has become almost overpopulated. So that's interesting, cha different challenges. Thank you. Hi, my name is Antonio. I'm from Madrid, and I have to agree with most of the people from here. And I think that the biggest problem is the efficient transportation. Hi, I'm Eriko from Hungary, and originally I'm from a little town with 15,000 people. And because of this, the biggest problem there, um, basically it's a nice place to live, but young people don't think so because it doesn't uh, offer any possibilities for young people. Not only because of job, there are some jobs, but uh, because of living there, because of leisure time and so on, and, say, uh, and they move to bigger cities. So it is lacking of young people. Excellent point on economic opportunities. <coughs> I'm Francesco from Italy. <coughs> I was born in the south of in a small village, but I spent most of my, my life in Tuscany. So in, I will talk about Luca. It is a small um, city, around 80,000 80, uh, people, and it is very well known about uh, environmental quality and historic buildings. So my point is how we, uh, we will maintain this quality of life and this preserve historic building and integrate it with modern building, yes. with modern urban planning, to maintain the same value we, we can enjoy right now for the next generation and, and maintain, of course, the quality of life uh, about environmental issues, uh, with pollution and traffic and this kind of stuff. I think that's a really good point about cultural heritage. I mean, a lot of the images that we'll see from other cities is that much of that's being basically pulled apart in order to build these new cities. Um, hello, my name is uh, Rodrigo, I live in, in Madrid. And I think that the main challenge in Madrid is in fact the planning system itself. 
um, it doesn't engage the, the city at all. And it's a very long and tedious uh, process that has no ability at all to adapt to, to changes which are in fact very, very fast in relation to the whole planning system process and how decisions are made and when they are made and who makes them. So this is uh, a, a fantastic point about a sustainable city being one where people can engage, a wide bunch of stakeholders can engage with the city in a positive way. Thank you. Hello, I'm Danca Martin. I'm from Madrid also. And I think one of the key urban challenges for the future is just to involve citizens, like non-expert citizens, in urbanism or in the, to transmit their, them the concepts of urbanism to, to, avoid, to um, make them be conscious about the impacts on the environment that the urbanization uh, has on the, on the con land consume or other consumes. And other of the of the challenges, I think, is the, to bring back the ratio, ras, rationalization or or scientific uh, criteria to urban planning, because I think the urban planning in the last years have been driven by economic principles and not by rational rationalism principles. Sorry. Uh, thank you. No, thank you very much. <laughs> Hi, this is Jaime Silos from Madrid. To add one more, I, I said we have uh, to face a major resource dislocation because <coughs> all around Madrid uh, there are more than a handful of uh, newborn suburbs with no population at all, with all the investment made with all the public transport and, and you know and facilities. So I think this is one of those th those neighbourhoods that need uh, need to be more integrated into the city. Thank you. Hi, uh, <coughs> my name is Juan Luis San Pedro. I'm CEO of Skybus. Uh, Skybus is a new form of transport, on-demand transport for cities. Uh, it allows basically go people from any point to any point directly without transfers at very low cost. So this allows that um, people have an alternative to private car yeah. because it's as flexible as the car and has a, a cost um, is smaller than, than the car. And especially uh, Skybus deals is concerned with uh, peripheric areas where yeah. urbanism is very sparse so that uh, public uh, collective transport systems do not really match the type of urbanism and do not really address connections between uh, poles, mobility poles in the periphery, say for example business parks and uh, residential areas. So this sure. is the kind of, of uh, mm, movements and mobility that Skybus basically address at this moment. Thank you very much and welcome. Lastly, I'm Tabith Ngandawire from Malawi, that is Africa. And I live in a city called Blanta, and I feel we have two major problems. One of it is the load network, but also waste management. We don't have the facility for waste management. Yeah. Thank you. That's, that's great. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I'll take that back. That's great. For all those inputs. Um, and I'm going to probably um, cover quite a few of them in the next few slides, but hopefully put it in a broader context um, for you. We had some good cultural, social issues as well as environmental issues, which I was pleased about. Um, I'm going to characterise the urban challenges of the 21st century with these uh, 12 or 13 points. Um, firstly, and close to my own heart as an urban designer, is the poor quality of urban design. Now, urban design we'll talk about more tomorrow, but in essence, it's, it's traditionally it's come out of a, uh, an idea that you can look at a city, these are the plans of different cities, and think about how you make how the people actually move and use those spaces and buildings around them whether it be a traditional grid such as new york uh, a more sort of organic form of uh, development such as rome or sort of hybrid such as london um, or any other city um, it's how you think about these spaces and buildings and how people use them um, but the reality of urban design in much of these rapidly urban, urban uh, urbanizing cities is actually incredibly poor this is the suburbs of istanbul one of the fastest growing cities in the world. Um, and it's traditional, uh, it, it could be anywhere though, but it, it, but it is essentially there. The, the municipal authorities built this very large road here, uh, very poor environment for, for cyclists, for people, pedestrians. You see this couple here struggling over what is essentially unmade land to get to, well, we don't know where to get to. There's no bus stops, where are the local shops, very hard to find them. And these towers, they're just sitting in open space. Um, and this is somewhat ironic, given that Istanbul has some of the best spaces, buildings, and, and places in Europe, I'd argue. Um, so it's creating these kind of uh, problematic um, suburbs. Um, moving to Mumbai, um, one of the, again, rapidly growing megacities in the world, 
Um, this is uh, some of the sort of more historic areas of Mumbai, and you see how flexible these buildings and spaces are, how democratic they are. 65% of the people in Mumbai work in the informal economy. A guy can come up and set up his stand here. No, one, you know, no one's going to move him on, or you know, he can negotiate with his peers. These buildings, they could be housing for people. They could be offices for people. OK, they look a bit messy, it looks dirty, it looks disorganized. On the other hand, it's a very, very adaptable piece of urban fabric, I'd argue. And in contrast, what the Mumbai authorities are allowing to happen in their city is for huge amounts of these gated developments to come up in and around the city. That's their solution to this uh, demographic change that we're seeing. Not only are these essentially enclaves for just one type of person, but they have their own internal malls, which are privatized space. So if you're an informal trader, you have no chance of applying your trade um, in a mall. Um, and the reality of the situation on the ground is that the poor and dispossessed get pushed onto marginal land, which is yet to be developed. Um, whilst uh, the well-off sit in their secure tenements. And as architects and urban designers, we often come up with these sustainable solutions. So there might be some sort of green roof building or a vertical uh, urban farm or something as a solution, um, technical fix. But I, I, I'm going to argue in the next two or three days that whilst uh, they have some place, the reality of the situation for most people living in cities is that that's a, that's a distant dream. Um, and you see these kind of images all the time. This could be anywhere. This is probably uh, you know, a plan for a Chinese city or Middle Eastern city. It doesn't really matter in a way. They're all the same. Um, and you get these architectural visions um, showing, showing people walking the street. There's no cars. Where are the cars? They, 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 they don't seem to appear here. We've got a monorail, which is shaded out. Why is it in the sky when there's, no, there's plenty of space on the ground? Where are the local shops? How do you... How do you move from this building to that building? Uh, which buildings are, um, uh, are residential buildings? Which buildings are office buildings? There's no clarity to that. Um, and actually, the reality of the situation, once it actually gets built, is something like this. This is Dubai. Um, and again, these places are very, very difficult to fit to higher energy prices and to the need to not move around using high amounts of resources. They're also socially unsustainable, I'd argue, as well. Um, China um, is building, has to build, there's an estimate that China has to build 100 cities of more than a million people in the next three years to cope with urbanization. And it's building them um, a central, they're kind of almost like cookie cutter cities. They just basically say, here's an area, we'll make it a city, and they zone it for cities. Um, they build lots of towers. Um, those are the towers from Google Earth, as they look like at the moment. Um, and that is the block that you've just seen. It's in a wasteland, it's an entirely empty city other than that block. So they've built um, many, many tens of thousands of apartments. No one lives there, it's in the wrong place, no one wants to live there. So these are the kind of responses in urban design terms which just don't work. Um, and China has a great heritage in creating fantastic, decent urban forms, such as these traditional houses, which are being demolished in essence to build uh, these high-rise forms of development. So urban design, the form of the city, massively important. Again, if you were working in this building here and you wanted to visit your friend who's working in this building, you'd have to cross this enormous roundabout at different levels. Um, these aren't human cities. These aren't places that we want to live and work in in the long term. The second key challenge is urban sprawl. A lot of people mentioned that already. Um, it's been going on in the States for a long, long time. Um, and it's been shown to have big impact on health. People drive everywhere. Uh, they become obese, unfortunately. Um, and they're very difficult to retrofit. It's very difficult to put shops and other local services into these places because there's simply not enough people to support them. Um, in fact, a, st a study was done um, some time back now which looked at the density of different cities. Um, so density is basically along this axis here. Uh, this is high density, that's low density, with the amount of transport energy that was used. And unsurprisingly, those North American cities that um, were, low de were low density, people had to drive everywhere. It's pretty obvious. Um, interestingly enough, the European cities tended to be in quite a good place. They're not too dense, so they're not overdeveloped, but they still have relatively low transport use. And the Asian cities tend to <coughs> increase the density perhaps too much. This is a traditional uh, sprawling uh, uh, retirement village in Florida, um, laid out so that every, uh, as many plots as possible have access to the water. That's the cell. That's the cell for the people who live there. 
Um, if, I'm, if I live here and I want to visit the local shop, maybe take my kids to the park, you know, normal things that people want to do every day, how do I do it? There's no bridges. I actually probably have to go all the way off the screen to actually come back down again. We're hardwiring in a, a form of lifestyle which we can't, we can't afford. Uh, and Sprawl does that uh, fantastically well. And what that means is the places aren't adaptable. So adaptability is a key requirement in creating a sustainable city. These, there are hundreds of malls in North America which are just dead because they haven't adapted to the changing economic uh, and different climates. Sprawl isn't just a first world issue. This is Mexico City. Um, it is also an issue across the globe. Transport congestion and infrastructure, people mention this most, I think, out of the, the responses we got today. And that's interesting, given I think Madrid's situation isn't actually that bad. There are a decent amount of metro lines. I don't know about the pollution. I've only been here for a day, but it doesn't, it doesn't feel too bad. Um, um, Shanghai, um, however, does have some big problems. And they are spending an awful lot of money building, um, building roads. They've built this big road here, and then um, they've had to build a double-decker road because there's not enough space on that road. Private cars have increased 25 times in the last 15 years. 600% increase in traffic accidents over 10 years. Imagine every traffic accident, the economic and social cost of that accident. But yet, an important statistic, only 9% of people drive to work. In London, it's 40. If Shanghai became like London, we, it, would, uh, it just wouldn't exist as a city. It just wouldn't, we wouldn't operate economically. So transport infrastructure is enormous issue and you can't build your way out of this problem. The Americans have tried. They spent billions of taxpayers' money building freeways, intersections, high state, and they've got some of the most biggest amount of congestion um, and longest commuting times in the world. If you've got a lot of money, you can build one of these. This is Tokyo's metro system. It's the biggest in the world. It serves 34 million people um, and 80% of people use it to go to work. So that's fantastic. For a developing world city, that's pretty good. Um, but a lot of people don't have that kind of money. Um, in Latin American cities, there's lots of experiments happening with transportation. Um, there are a number of cable car projects happening, which are they're, they're relatively low cost. You can get to the barrios on the, on the hillside pretty quickly. Um, you know, in, some, in some places, they're working quite well. This is Curitiba, and it's been, in, it's been sort of copied in many other places, including Bogota. Um, which is a bus rapid transit system where you essentially you set aside a piece of the road for buses and they're very, very quick um, and they're pretty low cost and they've, in place at Curitiba, have, have really transformed the place at relatively reasonable costs. And this is Lava PS, which I think some of the team are going to be talking about on Friday. Um, and I was there yesterday and, I, uh, and the City Council have tried to make the place a positive place for walking and cycling. And you can do that, and that can have a big impact. Copenhagen is probably the best example um, in Europe of where they've transformed their public realm, the way the streets are designed, the space is designed to encourage walking. And you actually see a real shift from cars and other forms to walking and cycling. The poor environment and climate change, a massive issue, particularly because most big cities tend to be on rivers or on the coastlines. Flooding, as we've seen in New Orleans, um, is a real issue. Hurricanes, typhoons, all those sorts of things. Even more importantly, the UN estimates that four in 10 people who live in temporary homes are at, flood, at direct flood risk. So they're disproportionately affected by, uh, by this issue. Energy uh, infrastructure is a big issue in many, many parts of the world. Uh, we're building huge numbers of coal-fired power stations, as many people know. Um, and some people here mention the, uh, the, the fact that pollution then affects the city itself, and, and that has a direct impact. In lots of parts of, say, Britain and other developed countries, we've moved those energy uh, production plants out of the city to rural areas, and therefore the impact's gone down. But I think there's a general sense that we need to make the city a place of production as well as consumption of energy, and to create a more uh, balanced grid and, and there are lots of ways this is a micro grid project where you've got a relatively green approach to producing energy that's in the city that doesn't cause pollution um, it's also more secure as well building technology communications technologies are massive challenges um, in how do you retrofit existing buildings how do you make them work socially and environmentally economically in Britain we uh, we've built 70% of the homes that will be there in 2050 
and 90% of those don't meet good building regulations. They're very leaky. The heat just, it's just lost from them. How do we deal with that massive, massive issue? Um, there's a vision of something called a smart city, which we'll talk a bit more about later on in the course, um, which is about connecting all the different parts of the city up um, using technology and allowing that to make the whole place run more effectively and efficiently. Um, and that's fine if you've got um, a huge amount of broadband. Um, different parts of the world, there's much, much less connectivity. Maybe they'll leapfrog our technology and put mobile uh, connections in um, so that you actually get, uh, get that level of connectivity happening. And this modern technology can absolutely transform the way we understand a city and how we move about it. This is an app that you can use to report fly tipping. You take a picture, you send it to somebody, and it gets sorted. So our relationship with our, each other, with other people in the city, and our relationship with the municipal authorities will be transformed by these technologies. We're already at the very beginning of this. Again, uh, technology can be used to make places more interesting. This is an art project that happened in Madrid. I don't know if anyone went to it, um, but essentially using technology to make the public space work better, make people come together, create cultural events. As I said, demographic change uh, is a massive driver. Mexico City's increased its population by 50 times in the last 110 years. In you know, London, our population is going very slowly, and we can't cope with it. Another great example. 45 people an hour are either being born or arriving in Mumbai. In London, it's one an hour, and we can't provide enough health care, schools, housing, transportation for those people in a rich city like London. How Mumbai copes is, uh, is, is a, big, a big challenge. Whilst there's a lot of growth, there's also a lot of decline. Particularly in Europe and North America, this map shows where cities are actually shrinking. As pe people move to other places, suburbanization happens, there's globalization of the job market. Even within one country, you can get a huge variety. So in the United States, the central Rust Belt and some of the northern industrial cities, these blue areas, are reducing significantly in their populations, whilst the areas in red, the west, the south, increasing their population significantly. <coughs> the kind of archetypal example is that of Detroit. Um, Detroit's population in 1900 was about 300,000 people. In 50 years, it went up by six times to almost 2 million. In the next 50 years, it halved again, back to 900,000. And in the boom years, the last 10 years, which in America have been ones of growth and prosperity, it's reduced its population by another 20%. The whole city is being hollowed out. Huge areas of land are being abandoned, essentially. People have started farming again in the city because there's just so much land. You might as well do something with it. Um, and lots and lots of properties are just being abandoned. So whilst there's a picture of growth, there's a picture of decline. It's complicated. Within each city, one of the biggest challenges we face um, in the developed world is that we are aging as population. And again, that reflects the population in cities as well. Um, and we need to create cities which allow people to age in a positive way. In the UK, in common with many other parts of the world, we have standards for new homes, which mean they have to be adaptable to people's lives <laughs> as they become less mobile. But I believe it's more than just the housing stock itself. It's about how we actually create a, a neighbourhood where people can stay and live in a mixed way. So we don't create those kind of retirement ghettos that we saw in Florida. The, 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 the job market is becoming much more globalised. We've got a great bunch of people here from around the world. That's a demonstration of the fact that people um, are looking further afield. I spent three years working on a project in the West End of Newcastle in uh, northeast England. This, uh, this shows the Tyne River um, and this huge area of industry in the West End, which was one of the workshops of the world. M many ships, guns, steel, all sorts of things were produced here and exported. And they built these um, large amount of, of Victorian workers' housing to, to house the people. Over the last second half of the 20th century, many of those jobs moved abroad, places like South Korea. This is one of the shipyards in South Korea, which builds most of those ships now, um, and left these places high and dry. And now you see most of those houses have actually been cleared, and we've created large areas of open land in our city. And our job is to think about how that area can become more sustainable, where you've got no local services, not enough people. How, those, how, do, you, how do you make those sort of places work? In fact, the council started selling houses uh, to local people for 50 pence in the 1990s. That's about 60, 70 euro cents per house on the basis that they would live there for 10 years, I think, 
um, and spend £5,000 investing in that property because those properties are worth so little. So uh, again, uh, a big issue uh, here. And again, looking at, back at growth, Bangalore, uh, India's tech city, um, there are $10,000 millionaires living in that city um, at the moment, which has absolutely changed the way the nature of that city works and created all these enormous business parks, such as this one, with these uh, rather interesting buildings. The response in the developed world is actually, there's, there's a kind of theory called creative, the creative class theory, which uh, uh, Richard Florida, who's a guy in the States, espouses. What he says is basically, in order for your, successful to, your city to be successful in a sort of post-industrial world, what you have to do is attract the creative class in. So make it a, a nice place to be, improve the quality of life. And these are the real wealth creators that will come into your city, and then there'll be a spin-off, trickle-down effect um, to the rest of the place. There are a lot of problems with this, with this approach. Um, it has some, some interesting points. Um, in the UK, we've spent a lot of time doing what we call cultural regeneration. So we're using culture as a mechanism to attract these people into our cities. Um, this was a, a one of probably several tens of art centres that were built in each of the major towns and cities around the UK. It cost £55 million. Pounds. It's probably going to have to close because there is enough money to run it. Um, so a lot of these things were built as mechanisms to create a more sustainable place, but don't actually work in reality. Um, and many people were upset by the fact they actually wanted more basic needs met rather than spending money on relatively well-off people already. Poverty and unmet basic needs are absolutely uh, crucial. Uh, this is a slum in Nigeria, uh, one of the biggest slums in the world. Some of these slums are bigger than Madrid region in terms of their population. It, absolutely enormous. Um, and, um, they, and in some countries, I mean, if you look at sort of Central Africa, for example, most of the cities are slums. So 80, 90 percent of the cities uh, are slums themselves. So this isn't just a marginal issue. This is a fundamental issue of, of poverty. Um, and, and all these issues are interlinked. I'm sure you're covering this elsewhere in your courses. But you know, if you have dirty water, poor infrastructure, which means dirty water, it means you get ill because you drink the water, which means uh, you can't work, and you get stuck in an economic cycle of uh, problems. Um, if you don't own your land, you're vulnerable to being knocked down, quite fundamentally. Um, uh, you can't get a bank account. You can't get a job because you don't necessarily have a fixed abode. Um, so all these issues are kind of interlinked. Um, and we can talk about these if people are interested later on. Uh, and some of the approaches that have been taken, i.e. Like slum clearance, don't work either because people just get displaced, often to much worse parts of the city, much more peripheral parts of the city. Segregation is, is an enormous issue in cities. Um, this is a very famous image of Sao Paulo. Um, I don't actually been there, but um, this shows quite how you get these gated communities, incredibly wealthy. People, these people have swimming pools on their balconies, they're so rich, right next to an informal settlement. This can't be a socially sustainable place where people can have that inequality of wealth right next door to each other. And it's, it's the spatial distribution of deprivation uh, and different wealth is really important. In London, we have most of our deprivation is focused in the east end of the city. It's traditional in industrial heartland. But we also have other pockets of deprivation around the other sectors of the city as well. So it's relatively distributed. Johannesburg is perhaps the other extreme. Most of the deprivation is focused around the outskirts of the city. So not all these people living in informal settlements or, or, or will have deprivation, but they also have long journey times to get to work. They don't have access to local services. The government is a long way away. Those kind of things make a big difference. There's been a decline in public funding uh, within cities. Um, I, I won't go into the detail here in Spain because I don't know the detail, but I know in England. Um, this is a map showing a coloured map showing where most of the reduction in public spending is has been so far since we've had a new government since 2010. Um, and if you map, so the black and red areas are areas where the biggest reduction per capita. And you find if you map on the areas which are cities, there's a, there's a direct correlation. So cities are losing funding at a greater rate than rural areas are. Um, and that's probably true uh, elsewhere as well. People talked about local citizen involvement. I think that's really, really critical. Um, traditionally, um, in the 20th century, I'd say in broad terms, was um, characterized by the increased power of the state over cities and its populations. 
The states collected most of the taxes. They, didn't, they gave some of, the, some of that money, went down to the region. And then a little bit of that money went down to the department and the, the community itself. The community often wasn't very happy about that. Um, and there's, I think there's a real movement globally now to try and cut the ties from the centre and allow local cities, neighbourhoods and um, towns to actually become more self-sustaining um, and engage with their, with, their, with their people more. For example, in Latin America in 1970, I think there were about 3,000 local authorities. Now there are like 16,000. So that's just a, a trend. Um, in the UK, we have a, a new bill going through Parliament called the Localism Bill. And this is trying to do exactly that, take go away from a command and control economy with the centre determining everything um, uh, and give more power back to local people. Um, there are issues with this. Um, we have a, a word in English called NIMBY, which means not in my backyard. That's what it stands for. And um, most people uh, are opposed development in the UK. It's, it's, it's traditional approach. And so localism also means that you can't necessarily tell people that we're going to have new homes in an area because they may not want the new homes. Um, and it's a big, 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 big challenge. Localism also ignores the fact that some places need to work together. We did a piece of work for five towns in Yorkshire, and we said that if they work together, they're more likely to get economic development than if they worked on individually, they're more likely to get investment into public transport, for example. So there is a role still for strategic planning. And lastly, but not leastly, um, there's a widening role of different stakeholders in the city. There's a massive influx of the power of the private sector in our cities. Um, it, traditionally in the UK, we the, gov the local government and government built towns, they built cities, they built whole neighbourhoods. Um, and now uh, the private sector is expected both to build them and to manage them. And if, if you've been to London recently, uh, we're getting ready for Olympics later on this year. This is uh, Stratford in the east end of London. That's a view back towards the city. Um, this is a huge area of old railway land which was essentially converted to a new part of the city. Um, and they've, um, they've built all the Olympic Stadium. I'm going to talk a bit more about that after the break. They've built an enormous shopping centre by Westfield, which is a big Australian developer. Um, and this is meant to be the sort of town centre for East London, in essence. But it's a private space. If you go in there, you, it is controlled. You can't, not everyone can move in. So it is, um, these aren't democratic spaces. But at the same time, I'd argue that technology is allowing people to interact in a way they never could do before. The fact that people can watch us on the web as an example, we can have commentary, live commentary going on, um, but it does enable local people to get involved in a different way. So um, I am going to talk about some responses to those challenges. If anyone's got any qu quick questions, yes. Uh, sorry, what do you mean with uh, democratic areas or not controlled, like parks or social areas? Or? Um, I suppose what I mean is that um, in a, Traditional public space, as long as you're not committing a crime, you can be there, in essence. Um, so whether that be a street, a park, or whatever. Um, if you're poor, you're rich, you're from whatever country or whatever background, you can go there. Um, and the, the public authority has a long-term interest in keeping that space working. And the public authority has broader goals than just simply making a profit, clearly. Um, in a lot of the sort of malls or the controlled environments of gated communities, what happens is that all that responsibility moves to the private corporation. They're, often their main goal is to make a profit, um, and they don't have the responsibility of allowing anyone in. They can, can, they can say, no, I don't want um, these people to come in here. And they don't have to be breaking a lot. They, you know, they, they can actually refuse entry. So it's a, an important trend in cities is this privatization of space, in essence. It's, it's a big debate that's happening. Um, around the world. Yes? Yes, I think you're right. I, th I think it is a bigger problem in, in places like India or, or uh, in South America. And I think it's I'm not sure of the exact reasons. I'd hazard a guess that um, because um, in developed countries the public authority had a long time to get established and to establish the, the ways of which working, it meant that, because um, urbanisation 
um, was a bit more controlled. Um, the state had a, had a greater role, whilst in um, places like Sao Paulo, I think it's uh, a bit more extreme. In terms of the, um, I, I think it's incredible the fact you get these, these you know, that image that I showed there. I mean, the fact you get these differences in one area is, is mind blowing, really, isn't it? So. Shall I move on to some responses? And then we'll have more time for questions um, at 11.30 if I get through these. Um, is everything okay? Are we going the right pace? Is it too slow or too quick? Is everything okay? Um, I'm going to talk about um, a range of responses right from the sort of region right down to the very local. I can't talk about all the responses because they simply would be here for months. Um, but I will just pick out a few uh, that I think might be of interest to you. Uh, from a planning perspective, um, in the UK government, uh, uh, basically uh, set a whole region aside as its eco-region. And this is what they call the Thames Gateway, which was the, 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 the area between East London, Stratford, which is where the Olympics are taking place, um, all the way out along the Thames estuary, including out to the North Sea. This is an area, a huge area of brownfield land, um, which brownfield means that it's been previously developed land, so old industrial land. Um, uh, that they wanted to use to solve some of the housing problems and some of the lack of, um, lack of development that we, that we have in the UK. It was also based on the fact that we, built, that we built a high-speed rail link, finally, the first one in the country. It took us a long, long time to do it between St Pancras and Paris. And so this was the, meant to be the trigger for, uh, for that change to happen. Um, and essentially what the uh, government did is they took power away from the local authorities and gave it to special bodies that were set up to deliver change happening in the area. Um, they set up a bunch of principles for, uh, for the eco-region. They wanted to enhance public transport, so they set up a whole bunch of projects, some of which, a lot of which haven't actually happened with, with buses and rail and other, other, other forms of public transport. They wanted to retrofit existing homes. There's a lot of existing neighbourhoods here. How do you make them greener? By retrofit, I mean putting insulation in, making the boilers more efficient, that kind of thing. Um, Again, most of the land was going to be brownfield, which is seen to be more environmentally friendly. So brownfield is this previously developed land, often contaminated, so it's got chemicals in it from the industry that was there. But also, interestingly enough, brownfield land tends to be left alone for long periods of time, so often it's actually more interesting ecologically than greenfield land, which has lots of, uh, can be quite, quite managed. There's lots of energy uh, and technical fixes, including things like district heating systems. These are meant to be very efficient systems, centralised systems that um, allow for uh, people to access heat cheaply um, and very, very efficiently. Obviously, it's along a river, so they need to manage flood risk. They had a big grid of walking and cycling routes to the whole region. Um, there's a green enterprise zone which has been established for uh, businesses, uh, which looks um, something like this. This is part of it, where uh, the UK government wanted to encourage in businesses that were going to grow on the back of the need to be greener, in essence, and cluster them all in one place. Um, the, the, the kind of outcome of it is that they've given planning permission for about 16,000 homes and space for about 14,000 jobs, but I'd argue that it probably was, uh, on balance, probably not a great success um, because um, many of the projects never got caught up by the big economic crisis and meant that things didn't actually get built. Um, and I think they, um, they didn't really deal with the social, prob the social issues at all. This enhancing community involvement never really got done. Um, they are building, uh, if you are in London soon, you can go visit this as a new centre for sustainable cities that Siemens are building um, in the Royal Docks. Um, again, I've not been there, but it'd be interesting to see when it is built, uh, finish this year, with it, how good it is. But if you go to the Olympics, then you can, it's just down the road from the Olympics. Um, so that was an eco-region. Stepping down to one scale to a new city, uh, there are lots of new cities. This is a global phenomenon. Lots of people are trying to build new cities from scratch. Abu Dhabi um, is building a new sustainable city in the desert um, called Mazda. Um, it is uh, designed by Norman Foster and it's based on traditional Arabic, apparently traditional Arabic urban forms. So it's a low-rise city rather than those towers that I showed you before. Um, it's, got, it's basically, essentially, it's a test bed for lots of different technology. So the idea is you either arrive by light, light rail, this is the light rail system coming in here, or alternatively, you drive in on these big roads, you leave your car on the edge, and you use a personal um, taxi, in essence, electronic taxi, that takes you to your place. Um, I'm quite cynical about this, but we'll see if it works. Um, 
There are lots of solar farms and various other things around, around the edge as well. Um, and here's another image showing all different kind of uh, approaches. There's, there's a use of, of kind of passive energy um, to try and make sure the place doesn't overheat because a lot of these glass cities have enormous loads of air conditioning on them. So the idea was to try and remove the air conditioning load. So Abu Dhabi started this in 2006. It's one of the richest places on earth. They've managed to build six buildings so far. That's the red area there. It's cost them a billion euros so far. It's quite a lot of six buildings. They're very nice buildings though. Um, they're, they're constructing these yellow areas at the moment. So, th so this essentially, there's two big squares here and they're, they're, they're building one of these squares. Um, now I think it's great that people experiment. I'm really up for this, but I, I'm also a bit unsure about some of, some of the issues. So this is the central square they've created. Uh, this is a wind, uh, I think it's a, a, some sort of wind um, chimney that basically draws cool air in uh, into the development. Um, and this is what it looks like from the outside. And in, in a way, this is kind of interesting. Again, in my professional life, I spend a lot of time trying to sort out these problems. They've moved the whole development up a story. So all the servicing and the access happens below, essentially on ground floor, but underground essence. And all the people move about above ground. And we've had an awful amount of experience in the UK of this just not working. Um, and you get in these sort of pods and you move around the city. Essentially, they're electronic. You put in your, where you want to go to, and three or four people can get in, like a taxi. Um, again, perhaps in a less controlled environment, um, such as UK, this place would be wrecked very, very quickly, I'm afraid. Sad but true. Um, a, a perhaps much more interesting um, example is how you retrofit an existing city. Rather than trying to create a new one, well, we've got lots of cities already. Let's try and do something with the ones we've got. Curitiba has been trying this for a long, long time. It's a massively growing city. They decided to put a proper plan in place, uh, which involved fundamentally reorganizing the public transit system. Um, I mentioned this before, it's bus rapid transit, runs on dedicated lines, it's very high quality service. It's like the metro, you go in, you go through barriers, you go onto, the, um, you go onto it. If you're very poor, you live in the suburbs, you can exchange your rubbish recycling for a ticket. So it encourages recycling and it allows the poor people to get involved. Um, and 30% uh, uh, less fuel per capita is, is, is used on fuel than in other Brazilian cities. 85% of people in the city use the system. So it's a very democratic system as well. It's not just uh, for the rich or for the poor. Um, and they've, uh, the use of buses has increased by 50 times since the system was put in place. So it's, uh, I'd say, very successful. But it's not just a bus system. This, is, uh, this shows one of the routes out of the city. And what they've done is they've zoned the kind of two blocks back, or one or two blocks back from that corridor to be higher density development. So they've said that because this is more accessible, we can allow for more people to live and work in the area. Um, so essentially, it's, I think that reinforces the idea that this, that this, this bus rapid transit works quite well. Um, and it's also allowed them to take some streets out of the city centre and create more pedestrianised environments, which encourages, can be a very positive thing. They've also increased the amount of green space in their city. Um, in 1970, there was one square metre per capita of green space, which is tiny. Now there's 52 square metres of green space. So a lot, what happened, a lot of the areas that were prone to flooding, they moved people out of those areas and created parks there, which is a sensible thing to do, um, and also increased the amount of uh, parks that there are in, in the city itself. Um, people, I don't know if any people have been to Curitiba, but people say it's a nice place to go to. Yes? Um, the answer is it depends on the nature of the green space. If the green space is um, sem sort of semi-wilderness, almost like this, then it's, the cost is very, very low. If it's very, very formal green space, like the Madrid-Rio type uh, view, that would be higher, obviously. Um, it, it does vary. Uh, it does vary considerably. Um, what, what we found, um, just an interesting point um, in the UK, is that we traditionally got lots of parks in our cities, which is great, um, and they just mow them every like three or four weeks. And what they found is that actually that's more expensive than leaving some of them to have wildflowers in them, which creates more um, uh, environmental diversity. So sometimes it's best to spend less money and maintain them less, actually, because you get better um, diversity. Yes. <coughs> Same wild, which 
rather than some uh, animals of the natural biodiversity. And these parks attract a lot of tourism. And this tourism helps you with the economy of the city and helps the maintenance. That's very good point. Chiba is, is called the, the London of Brazil. <laughs> Well, that's, yeah. that's very kind for London, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Any other points? Um, do, yeah, do, 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 do ask some questions. Um, so moving down from the whole city retrofit, that's what I call retrofitting, the idea of how to sort the city out, existing city, um, lots of places have tried to create new districts within cities. Um, this is one of the most famous ones. It's Hammerby in, uh, just outside Stockholm. Um, it was originally planned for the 2004 Olympic Games, which they lost. But being uh, Swedish and very efficient and effective, they got on with actually building it anyway. Um, it's old industrial uh, bit of land um, just to the south of the city. Uh, and I think it works very, very well indeed. Um, it was trying to do lots of different things. Um, sorry, get another way. Um, it was based again on a public transport spine through the area. Um, this is, in this case, it was a tram route which linked to the, the metro. Um, and again, if you look along each of these routes, they also have all the shops here. So you can get off the tram and use the shops very easily. Um, they used a whole range of different technologies to try and make the place greener. Um, and some of them worked better than others. They had things like solar cells, convert solar energy. They've got carpools to reduce the private motor travel. That's worked. That can work very well. And we can talk about that a bit more if people are interested. Um, safe footways and bikeways. Um, they've got this system where all the waste is actually sucked from your apartment into a central recycling centre, in essence. Um, and apparently it works very well. Again, whether it will work well in all societies, I question, but it's, it seems to work in Sweden. Um, there's a whole range of other, uh, other points that they make. They've also got... Sorry, yeah? Uh, heat exchanger. Uh, I don't know the details of it. In essence, um, I think that the, um, they use it for... Uh, they use water treatment, has, uh, they use some of the energy from the water treatment to either heat or cool the buildings. There's, um, I can see more material if you're interested, there's, there's a whole bunch of other material on it. They've got, they've got low flushing toilets, they've got combustible waste, so uh, for example they burn some of their waste to create heating. Um, the rainwater is treated and kept, and, and so it's the, the flood risk is actually reduced. They've actually got this system here which um, essentially, like a, they try to make a closed system for environmental um, components. So, for example, uh, human waste, uh, when it's produced, is used on local farms to produce biofuels. Those biofuels are then burnt in the local district heating system, which then produce heat for the homes and also for the leisure centre and other things, and also electricity. So you kind of have a closed loop there um, of, of waste moving through the system. And there are other, other components to that system as well. And it, and it works pretty well. I'm going to move a very different place now. So, is anyone have any questions about e Hammerby? Um, yeah. The criticism, I suppose, of Hammerby I mean, is that I don't know the honest answer of how many homes there are. I think it's, it's in the region of about 10,000 homes, so it's probably 20 to 30,000 people, that kind of thing. Exactly. It's a really good point, particularly where you're working with an existing neighbourhood, and we're going to talk about that uh, in a minute. But yes, where you've got a brand new neighbourhood, you have the dilemma of who do I consult with, who do I work with. I've got this area, it's empty. Who are the people who are going to move there? I don't know who they are. So how do I actually design and work with them to make the place work? Hammerby is, I suppose, the one criticism of it is that it's a bit of a, a, a you know, middle class enclave of people. It's relatively well off. It attract, because its environmental credentials are so good, it attracts certain kinds of people. Um, it does, and so perhaps it, it is not necessarily representative. I think when we're talking about all these examples, we have to think about, are they scalable? Can they be repeated elsewhere or not? The Mazdar example, I'd argue, is, in, is not scalable. We can't be, you know, most, most parts of the world, they can't just go around building new cities for billions and billions of euros. They have to retrofit. So whilst they're interesting experiments, I think we need to always question, how can we apply this elsewhere? This, I think, is an uh, example where we can apply an example elsewhere. Um, Kailisha 
is one of the largest townships in Cape Town, about half a million people. It was built in the late part of the apartheid regime in South Africa, um, essentially as a dormitory uh, settlement for black South Africans who would live there, they would then come into the city to work and then go back again. So there was almost no facilities built there, it was simply just, here's a bunch of houses. Um, and obviously, even with a new regime, they've, they've got these settlements, they've got to do something with them. Um, what's interesting about Kailisha also is that only 7% of people are above 50. It's an incredibly young place. Um, it has some of the opposite problems that we have in, uh, in the UK. And that's a sort of typical view, the kind of place it is. It's sort of low rise. Um, lots and lots of different homes have been built, mainly by the people who live in them. Uh, lots of spaces between buildings that no one really knows who, they, who owns them. And this has led to a lot of problems with crime. Crime is probably the single biggest issue, social sustainability issue, if you want to call it that, um, in Kailisha. Um, and so one of the responses by the government uh, was to institute a, a, um, a program of trying to tackle this through urban design. Um, the, first of all, they mapped all the places in the city, uh, in the area that had high areas of crime. That's a school, for example. And if you look at the next slide, that's the same school there. So the pink areas in this plan here show where in the city most of these uh, areas of crime are. And what they then did is they said, and said in those areas, we're going to do something very simple. We're going to create well-lit, well-overlooked walking cycling routes. And every 500 meters or so, we're going to have a new building that's going to have what we call an active box. It's going, to have, it's going to be open 24 hours a day. It's going to have some employment uses in it. It might have some people living in it. It might have a community use. So that if you're walking along here, you can see the next one the whole time. And the reason why I call this urban acupuncture is because it's just doing something very small in a way on a grand scale, but it, it has had an enormous impact on crime rates in the area and sense of safety. This is a picture of these routes, lighting, school kids moving to school on, on those routes. Um, this is an example of the active boxes, uh, which just simple buildings that people put up um, in order to, to support the uses. And then they have put lots of play areas. This is an immensely young population. Um, and a lot of these kids couldn't go out after dark. Yes? Doesn't that just move the problem to another region? Well, in, in this case, it probably doesn't because the, the, you haven't actually moved anybody. You've simply just said, here's some existing routes and we're going to really improve them and we're going to just focus all the movement on one. Beforehand, um, sorry, it's probably quite hard to see, but um, in essence, people could move very informally through this area. There were no secure places at all, so all the people were dispersed. What we're doing, and what they've tried to do, is focus all the people onto a few number of routes, which means it feels much safer. I agree with you. I think if, if the alternative approach would be to actually take out large amounts of homes to build these routes, in which case you might displace some of those people. So, any, uh, so this idea of urban acupuncture, we're going to return to on the third day of our, uh, of our working together. The idea of what is the smallest thing you can do to make the biggest impact. I think it's a real theme for our austere times that we're living in at the moment. <coughs> this is um, another example from Latin America. Um, this is from a city in Chile, um, which um, has grown, again, massively. Um, this is the central business district in and around here. And um, in and around the city centre, lots of informal settlements grew up over the last dec few decades. One particular uh, inner suburb, should we say, uh, was occupied illegally for 30 years by 100 families or so. They built their, their homes here. Um, but <coughs> the Chilean government wanted to offer them new homes far away on the outskirts of the city, but they would be brand new. But they didn't want to move. Their, their jobs, their lives, the community was there. Um, and so the challenge for the architects, uh, which is a fantastic architecture company called Elemental, who are based out in Chile, and done a lot of work in Latin America uh, on this kind of approach, um, looked at how could this area work, given they didn't own the land. So the fundamental question um, is that the Chilean government will give you $7,500 as a subsidy for every new home. That was fixed. The challenge of the community was how do we buy land, infrastructure for those buildings, so the sewers, the electrical thing, the electric supplies, the streets, 
and how do we actually do the building for seven and a half thousand dollars? Now, if you you obviously go and buy land elsewhere, which is very very cheap, but, it, but land in this, this part of the city because it's quite central, it's quite expensive. So once you've paid for your land infrastructure, you're only left with enough money to build 30 square meters of home. Now, 30 square meters is about half a small home, roughly speaking. Uh, a, a sort of traditional family house is about 100 square meters or so. Um, so what the architects did... That subsidy was for, for each person? For each house, for each home, each household. So what, what they did is they worked, um, the architects worked with the local community to come up with the idea of rather than moving them, which, uh, if they could only build half a house, which half should they build? That was the question. So which half was it that the architects could get built and then the people over time when they had a bit more money and they saved up, they could build the other half? And that was the approach they took there. Um, and in essence, this is the actual design of the homes themselves. Um, what they offered the people is a shell, so it's not a finished home. Um, you have a ground floor apartment, an upper floor apartment, in order to fit 100 homes back onto that same site. And you have all these spaces which are allow, allow you to fill them in over time. And they've repeated this approach in many, many places um, uh, in Latin America. And it's been, um, I'd say it's just been very successful because in essence, the alternative, because land prices in central areas are so high, is actually that they become peripheral communities. What happens is, this is what it looks like on day one when no one lives there. And over time, you see that people have actually started to fill in these spaces underneath the homes themselves. They've invested in the place. This model of co-investment, the idea that it's not about the government or local authority or big business uh, just doing it to a community, just making a community more sustainable. It's about everyone investing in that place, I think is going to be a big theme again in our third day we'll talk about. Again, showing the previous situation, uh, lots of kind of informal buildings, and the situation afterwards where they now have title. They actually own those buildings. They own the property, so they can't be moved off. The kind of situation um, at the end of the build, you get something like this. Went back a couple of years later, and people have done this to it. We don't always know as professionals what's right for people. The architects ask people, do they want a bath or do you want a hot water boiler for, to heat up water? Now, if you ask me, I probably, I'll certainly want a boiler because I want hot water and I can, you know, we can f find another way to have a shower or something else. But here they actually wanted a bath because the running costs for a boiler, the gas costs, they couldn't actually provide themselves. Um, so, Again, when we're talking, thinking, working with communities, have to have an open mind about what actually works. I'm going to take um, some questions now um, and a five-minute break, uh, well, so a ten-minute break for people to go to the loo and things. And I've got a few more case studies that I can go through afterwards. Um, so if maybe two or three questions, and then we'll come back and finish, aim to finish uh, in the next sort of half an hour after that. Is that okay? Have I? Yes. I have a concern. I have seen from your presentation the key challenges is perhaps a mix of symptoms, problems, and root causes. And uh, the solutions you are providing. Sorry. I, I think that the, the key challenges you presented previously are a mix, perhaps, of symptoms, uh, problems, and root causes. Yes. And what I find lacking a little bit is a more uh, systematic approach, because I, I think what you are showing is a set of very complex, multifunctional, multi-everything issues that are very difficult to approach from just one point of view. Sure. So, um, for example, I, I think the technological perspective is one, the economic perspective is another, the social perspective is another one, and the economic perspective is uh, finally another one. So, what you have shown are uh, some solutions which mm, can be very uh, effective from one or two or three of those perspectives, but that might not work in different environments in which uh, 
the situation can be very different. So I, I don't think it's only um, a question of a scale, um, a scalability, but a different uh, response to different set of issues. Yes. So uh, what do you think of, of, are you going to deal with this sort of uh, multi-perspective systematic issues in the, in the next uh, I, I hope so, yes. Uh, it's, a, it's an excellent question um, because I agree in a way what I was trying to do this morning was just give you a flavour of some of the issues and a flavour of some of the responses. In 12 hours one cannot hope to cover uh, you know, the topic in anything more than a very, very high level. On the third session we're going to be talking about why we've set up this organisation called Smart Urbanism and why we think it's a way of thinking about the problems that, uh, of the multidisciplinary issues that, that we've raised today. So I appreciate, yes, I've not presented you with a grand theory of how to respond to the, to the problems. Um, I'm, I don't think there is a grand theory. I think there, are, there is a process and an approach which can be helpful. Um, and in terms of your other points, yes, the answer, uh, each, every specific neighbourhood, town, city, region has its own requirements for a, a defined response. One, one, <coughs> one, one cookie cutter approach cannot, cannot work here um, and that's why you can't import Curitiba and say I want to put Curitiba into, well I think in Curitiba they tried to make Bogota try to copy Curitiba. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't work. Um, you know in Britain, London we're trying to copy Stockholm to make those eco districts. It probably won't work in different ways because of the different social, cultural, economic environment. So, um, in terms of your two points, yes, I will hopefully bring a, a slightly more formulated response by the third day. And secondly, I think it is a nuanced approach. This is a very, very complex area. It depends on the people and the place involved. And that's what's fascinating about it, because every place is different. different multidisciplinary issues and different symptoms um, but in your experience what has been a trend that the city uber planners are being given the priorities when come up to with developing policies because we have been talking about uh, pollution congestion issues a lot here but do you think that there's uh, some points and all the city planners are more focused these days and about the smart grids which uh, countries are investing more in the developing the smart grids or this technology of how to combine waste management and energy efficiency and pollution management? Thank you. Um, in terms of planning, um, planning is based on, is actually meant to be a science in the sense that you're meant to, it's meant to be an evidence-based approach. Every decision you make, every plan, every policy you have in that plan has got to have an evidence base for it. Um, and I think um, what that's also meant is that it's a very problematic process. Um, in terms of um, the priorities, they'd vary. Um, clearly, if you're going to hand over a lot of the development of your city to the private sector, the economic component of planning becomes one of the most important ones. Um, having said that, though, you know, planners, most people who go into planning want to make the world a better place. They're not there to... <laughs> Uh, you know, to, to make it any more, any more difficult. They're actually, they're, they're idealists. Um, so there are, um, there are many approaches which are more positive than that. But I'd say is the economic um, perspective is perhaps the most powerful, along with this idea that you can prove everything. You can show what the population will be like in 10 years and start building a school now ready for that 10-year process. Well, we've shown that you can't predict the, the, the future. We all know that. Um, in terms of the smart grids, um, perhaps the most famous example um, that I haven't shown any slides of um, is one in South Korea called Songdo, uh, which is essentially is an industrial park, in essence. Uh, it's probably the biggest private development of its kind in the world. Um, and there they've basically put fibre optic cable into pretty much everything. Every building, every street, every lamppost, everything has got, um, is connected. And they're testing to see whether that actually makes it a place people want to live. Okay, it's great, it's all connected up, but that, that's the idea. Um, I, think, I think there will be a, um, I think the Internet of Things, as it were, will, um, will mean that cities 
become much more interactive. Uh, the fabric of the city becomes much more interactive. And I suspect that we will leapfrog bro fixed um, broadband very, very quickly and move to mobile, uh, mobile um, kind of receptors and things.